Today, we are reviewing the Ninja Foodie Possible Cooker Pro. This amazing, what appears to be amazing, we haven't used it yet, this is a pretty cool Ninja slow cooker. Uh, does all kinds of different functions, as you can see here. Slow cook, sear, saute, steam, keep warm, sous vide, braise, bake, and proof. So we're gonna jump right into this video and we're gonna try steaming some broccoli. So I've got a cup of water and roughly four cups fresh broccoli here. You'll see that this has this little kind of cool spoon that sits onto the lid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this on and we're gonna go down to steam. Comes with this nice little book like all Ninja Air pro or Ninja products do. But it's showing here for broccoli, one cup of water, five to seven minutes. So we got our cup of water. I'm gonna put that in, add our broccoli. And we're gonna set our timer for five to seven minutes. Why don't we go six? So we're gonna go steam, six minutes, start. So with most new Ninja products, we've noticed, because we've done, we've reviewed quite a few, they have this progress bar that shows the product actually heating up or getting ready. So the timer won't start until these bars are complete. So this product we ordered from the US, I don't believe it's available in Canada yet. Uh, we're not affiliated to Ninja whatsoever. Uh, we buy our own products, we review them, we give an independent, honest review, so keep that in mind. This product was $149 US, this pot here is removable, actually could go right into your oven, upwards of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You can buy, according to the book, you can buy two accessories for this. They have a steam, steaming and roasting rack, and they also have a travel kit or travel case for it. What's interesting though is when I went onto the website that was in the book, I couldn't find them anywhere on their website. I tried searching it by the model number, tried searching it by the product name, so maybe they're not available yet, they're forthcoming, I don't know, but it was in the book, so I had checked that out. This pot that I just showed you, the pot itself, the lid, and this utensil, all dishwasher safe, which I know my boy Jamie loves. He hates dishes, he's all about what can go in the dishwasher. And then they say, and I think it sounds fancier than it is, I don't really know, I don't think we're gonna be able to show that today or prove or disprove it, but they call it a triple fusion heat technology, cook 30% faster than a conventional oven. So I'll leave that with you to make your own determination. I don't know how they established that through tests, I guess, but we're not scientists and we're not energy specialists, so we're certainly not gonna be able to establish that, but that's what the book says. So you'll see here, uh, our time it just literally started. We're still at six minutes, and if you look in, I don't know if, you know, I'll remove that. You can start to see that the water is uh, steaming, actually. It's actually quasi-boiling and I can smell it. If you had the rack, I think it would be almost like a double broiler where you uh, have your water below and your um, veg on top. This is sitting within the water, but presumably you shouldn't have to stir it because it should just steam it all the way through, but we're gonna see. So we just finished our cook. I was doing some prep. So steamy, steamy. So we're gonna use our utensil that comes with the product. So I could tell just by touching these that they appear to be very, Nicely cooked. And I guess it's like anything else, if you prefer your broccoli a little more al dente and a little bit harder, then you would steam them for less. And if you like it a little bit softer or on the mushier side, you would steam them for more. But we'll let this sit for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll try one. So let's steam some potatoes. So according to the book, it says four cups of water, 15 to 20 minutes. I tried to grab four potatoes that were evenly sized. I'm gonna do the old fork trick and maybe just Give them a little bit of a stab, and I'm gonna start setting those in. All right, I think that's pretty good. We've got four cups of water here. Now, of course, it helps. Uh, I, I put some warm water in this, so I think it helps with the, uh, I guess, heat up process. So we're gonna put that on. We're gonna go down to steam, and we're gonna put our time at 20 minutes, and we're gonna hit start. So what you can see here, and we've noticed this in multiple Ninja products before, the status bar, progress bar, whatever you wanna call it, is considerably fur down the line here because the pot itself is, is still warm because we're doing multiple tests. The unit itself retains some of the heat that the preheat process is quite a bit slower. So I'm gonna try a piece of broccoli. You can still see it's still pretty steamy. Hmm. So I would say that this is perfectly cooked, like perfectly. I would write it down somewhere in my phone, make a note that steamed broccoli, four cups, one cup of water, six minutes. So the one thing I just noticed is it goes from one minute to zero. So it doesn't count down in seconds. So that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're doing other things in your kitchen to prep or whatever, it goes right from a minute down to zero. And it doesn't beep. So Jamie and I were just talking while we we're waiting for these potatoes to finish off, how quiet this machine is. Because as you probably know, as you're a huge fan of the average kitchen, as you probably know, we do a lot of air fryer 
fryers, those types of uh, videos, and they're loud, and we always obviously know when they're running, and they beep quite loud with that sort of patented ninja beep. In this case here, deathly quiet, and no beep to let you know it's done. So I don't think that in this Steam setting, we'll see maybe in some of the other settings, I don't think in the Steam setting that there's any harm in, I guess, oversteaming a potato, but I think, my opinion, I would have liked to see a beep. All right, so right away I could tell that potato is not finished, not cooked. This one got away from me, using my left hand here. Also, not cooked. Couple takeaways from this. The one thing I noticed compared to, because we're used to Ninja products, compared to other Ninja products is, in the back of the book, in the chart, often they will say either a weight of the product or a uh, amount of the product that you're going to do. So for example, I guessed and did four cups of uh, broccoli. In this case here, it just says potatoes. It doesn't say the size of them. It doesn't say how many of them. It just says potatoes and it says whole. And then it says four cups of water, 15 to 20 minutes. So I did four whole potatoes, big enough potatoes, but they're not humongous potatoes. And I did it on the high side of 20 minutes and they're not done. So the potato test, in my view, bit of a fail in the sense that this is one of those trial and error things where I would have to write down Maybe these need five more minutes. Maybe they need 10 minutes. I don't know, but you could definitely see on every single one of them, it's raw in the middle. So that's not good. Minestrone soup. So I'm gonna follow the instructions basically to a T on this. Turn the dial to sear saute. Set the temperature to high, which it already is. Press start, which we're going to do. And it says, and it, you'll see that it's starting to count up. It says to preheat this unit for five minutes. So what we did in between uh, tests here and some prep work is I sliced up three large stalks of celery. So three large stalks of celery, three large carrots and a white onion. And we're gonna sear and saute, sear slash saute that along with our garlic and a little bit of oil. We're gonna get those sauteing. So I've got some garlic prepped and you'll see here I've got some fresh green beans as well, but we're gonna add those right at the end of the cook so they don't get all mushy and gross. So we're almost at our five minute mark for our preheat. We were just talking, we don't know if it's gonna chime. We didn't set a timer, but maybe this is the standard preheat for the sear saute, so we got about seven seconds left. We're soon gonna find out. I'm gonna add some oil and get that heated up as well before I add my veg. So no, it didn't chime. I'm gonna use avocado oil. We get chirped, I don't know why. We get chirped all the time. You shouldn't use canola oil, you shouldn't use, we just do these tests following what the book suggests that you use. It suggests that you use canola oil. We're going off the wall here and we're gonna use avocado oil, which I hope will appease some of our oil connoisseurs. So I'm gonna give that a, a minute or so uh, to heat up. I could have thrown that in, I guess, earlier, but I could definitely feel the heat. We'll give that a, a second just to heat up that oil, and then we're gonna add our uh, veg and our garlic and get that uh, sauteing. So I'm gonna throw this stuff in, let's see. Uh Hopefully you got that sound there, Jamie. Roughly three or four cloves of garlic. We're gonna add some salt and pepper, and then we're gonna use a wooden spatula. So let's give that I don't know, five minutes, three, four minutes, and uh, then have a look. So we've given our vegetables five, six minutes. Our celery's starting to come a little bit um, translucent as well as our onions. So the next step that they suggest or they, they put in the book is actually to turn the dial to bake. We're gonna set the temp to 400, 30 minutes. We're gonna hit start. 16 ounces, which is it, it actually ended up being one box of uh, elbow macaroni pasta. We're gonna put that in. We're gonna add one can of diced tomatoes, and then we need to add 12 cups vegetable stock. So this is a Campbell's made from real vegetables, vegetable stock, which we did the math is just over three boxes. So obviously the capacity of this, and we, I did not talk about that, and I, and I will, the capacity of this um, is uh, quite large. Really, we only need probably about a quarter of this, but rather than put half a box of this in the fridge, I'm just gonna use the whole thing. So essentially it'd be r roughly, what Jamie, 13 cups. So I certainly don't feel that that's gonna affect uh, the flavor of the soup or anything, but it definitely shows you the volume. It's quite large and I'll look up that stat for you to give you specific. So then it calls for a tablespoon of uh, dried oregano. So. What's interesting is it says set the timer for 30 minutes, but at the 25 minute mark, you're supposed to add your green beans. So we did set it for 30 minutes, but I'll have to set a timer on my phone to remind me uh, for the last five minutes to throw those uh, green beans in. So we're gonna give that one last stir and we're gonna throw our lid on. So what we just noticed is it beeped at the end of the cook. When we were in the sear saute section, it does not beep, but in the 
bake section it does and it automatically then converts to counting up. So essentially it then goes to keep warm, which um, is obviously a lower heat setting than um, the 400 degrees that we were at. I didn't do it on camera, but with uh, five minutes left in the cook, I added the green beans, which you can see are here. Obviously you can see this is ripping hot. I want to try and see how the carrots turned out and how the pasta is. So you can see here, there's our soup. This is a fuego. So I'm going to uh, just give this a couple minutes to cool down and then we're gonna try it. All right, so the soup's cooled off. First thing I'm gonna do is try a carrot with a little bit of pasta here. So it's almost there, but it's not. The pasta's okay. The broth's fantastic. You get a green bean here maybe. Green bean and lastly, I'll try the celery. So celery's still crunchy, so it all depends. Normally soups, the uh, veg is a little on the softer side. The celery for me is fine. The carrot is a little bit too hard, but realistically, half an hour cook, this is low cooker, it was in a bake setting, isn't a whole lot of time. They were pretty good sized carrots. That's, that's minor, that's just cooking a little bit longer, not a big deal, but for a very quick cook and for a very quick um, recipe to put together, it's actually really good. We're gonna do a buffalo chicken mac and cheese casserole. According to the book, it actually suggests a box of macaroni and cheese. Everybody knows KD, or maybe you don't know, but Kraft Dinner. So it literally says to open up the box and just put the pasta in. So let's do that. So there's our, our packet. We're gonna put in our two cups of water. And I'm gonna say this right up front that I'm a little bit pessimistic, as I am sometimes with these product reviews, because it never says to drain the water. I don't know how much water is gonna be left here, but I'm a little bit concerned with that. Turn it on, we go to the bake setting. 400 degrees, 17 minutes, start. So it does say throughout the cook, you're gonna to want to uh, stir your pasta. And then it says while you're cooking your pasta, you wanna set your kitchen stove uh, or oven, I should say, to broil. So again, a little bit pessimistic on how the pasta, is it gonna absorb all the water? We're gonna find out. So Jamie and I were just having something to eat. This whole thing started to sort of almost bubble up. I did check it numerous times and stir it, but I wanted to show you and I was, with an abundance of caution, concerned with this whole idea of not draining the pasta water. But as you can see, there's basically no moisture left. So that's not a bad thing, I guess. I'm reluctant, but I'm, I'm gonna stop the cook there because I certainly don't want this to burn because if it burns, it's ruined. And we don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna turn it off. So the next steps was, the first thing to do was to preheat our oven to broil. So I'm gonna get this off the heat, add the reserve cheese packet, and then chicken, buffalo sauce, butter, milk, and vegetables. Well, maybe I'm wrong here. Leave a comment, but who would put vegetables in a buffalo mac and cheese? Jamie? No, he's nodding his head, zero chance. Just over half a cup of uh, half and half. And we've got our ranch, which I just, after I poured this, realized I may have misstepped here. Yeah, the ranch was supposed to be mixed in with uh, our topping, but that's okay. And we're gonna put in our chicken. So I'm gonna throw in a little bit of uh, Frank's buffalo. That should be good. I'm gonna mix that up. It actually smells amazing. Evenly cover the top of the pasta with the breadcrumb mixture. So there's our, our topping. So we're just gonna now carefully put that all across the top. I don't think it's gonna be perfect the way that it's set up here, but I think it is gonna serve its purpose. Uh, I didn't notice afterwards I, I turned the oven on, I realized this pot's pretty deep. So I thought, yeah, I hope it's gonna fit in the rack position that we have. So it's something you may wanna keep an eye on, but we're fine, but just. So we're gonna slide that in there on broil and we're gonna keep a close eye on it because broiling uh, can be dangerous. So I never timed it, but I was cautiously watching. I'm gonna say it was uh, in the eight minute range. What I'm gonna do is just scoop some out and then I'm gonna let that cool down for a few minutes and then give it a try. Trying to get a little bit of everything here, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of the topping. Still obviously you can see ripping hot. Very good, very good. So what I'm gonna try to do now is saute and sear a bunch of onions and then ultimately start to caramelize them. So I don't know how that's gonna work in this capacity in this. It does say sear saute. Generally, as you probably know, or maybe you don't, uh, if you wanna get that deep brown color, it takes some time. We're gonna hit the power, we're gonna go to sear saute, we're gonna hit start. Roughly, the book suggests five minute warm up time on the saute, so we're gonna do that. You'll see it's starting to count up. I'm gonna add some avocado oil, and we're gonna get these uh, going. Just over five minutes, almost six minutes on here. I got some avocado oil that I threw in. This is roughly two full white onions. 
We'll let those start to cook down and obviously we'll stir them. And I think in this uh, capacity, I will also put the lid on or partially put the lid on. Our onions have been sauteing for roughly 15 minutes. Our timer's at 22. I think it was about six minutes when we started to um, throw them in. They needed to heat up, so on and so forth. I did throw the lid on. I think realistically, if you were gonna be doing French onion soup or you want like a deep caramelization, maybe you'll get there with this, but I think it would take quite some time. So you can see where we're at right now. Like you can see some brown, and they are starting to brown up. I think you would get there maybe eventually, but it would just take, take some time. But I just wanted to demonstrate, you know, the ability to be able to saute slash sear because realistically the capacity of this pot, it's actually deceiving. It's way bigger than it actually looks because what did you look it up, Jamie? It says 32 cups, I think it said. 34 cups, which was what, eight liters you said? Eight liters. Eight liters. So pretty massive volume capacity in this, to be honest. So you could, literally saute your onions down here and caramelize them and get them into a, a deeper browner color and then add your beef stock and your wine and make your French onion soup all right in this pot. So that's kind of cool, something that I'm probably gonna do in the future. So now we're gonna jump into doing a chicken pot pie, again from the book. It's set up on the sear saute, roughly it takes five minutes to get that up to temperature. I threw in some avocado oil. So I've got a couple stalks of celery, I did throw a carrot in, which was not in the book. In the book, they suggest they just say frozen vegetables. I'd rather, I have carrots here. I'd rather just cut up a carrot and put an actual carrot in. And then we cut, cut up a bunch of creme and mushrooms. We're just over the four minute mark. I'm gonna to start to throw the stuff in. And we got our mushrooms and get that mixed up a little bit. One thing that's kind of unique is they never suggest putting the lid on when you're searing and sauteing. I'm not sure why, maybe it just creates too much condensation, but it doesn't generate a ton of heat like if you were on a gas stove top like I'm used to for sauteing, so you have to be a little bit more patient. Next step here talks about putting all the ingredients in, temperature to 350 on the bake setting. Then we just go to bake, 350, start. So we're gonna add in a cup and a half of half and half, two cans of cream of chicken soup. I'm gonna put in three cans. I like when pot pies or a chicken and broccoli casserole is a little bit on the creamier side rather than dried out. So we're also gonna add in our green beans, very large amount of chicken. So this is, again, uh, Costco rotisserie chicken. I wanna try to break it up a little bit. But I do have some summer, summer savory, which is generally used for a turkey dinner. To me, I think that's gonna be a nice seasoning, so we're gonna add that once I get my hands cleaned up here. So it calls for a teaspoon, so that's over just over a good size pinch. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. So we're gonna cover that, I think. We'll do 15 minutes and we'll just hit start. Uh, kind of funny story, we picked up the wrong pie crust. We actually picked up like pie crusts as opposed to like a pie crust sheet. It certainly doesn't look pretty. It's a little bit butchered. I cut some slits in the top. Uh, so it's not awesome, but hey, this is the average kitchen. It's not a big deal. We're gonna throw it in the oven. It's gonna taste the same. It's just not gonna look perfect, but um, I'm not a pastry chef, so. And I believe it was 40 minutes. So we just, as you can see, it's still molten lava here, bubbling around the sides of our super ugly topper. I mean, really doesn't matter. It serves the purpose. You're just gonna eat it, but it, it, it you know, I'm not taking pictures of this and putting it on Instagram, let's just say that. The reason I set it back into here is because we didn't do actually use the slow cooker setting today, I just wanted to see, and I haven't even tried this yet, because we couldn't try it because you cannot go through the settings unless the pot is in the uh, cradle, I guess. I just wanted to see on the slow cook side, they have high, low, so it's just high or low. And you could, okay, so you can set it for a certain amount of time and it should turn off then, presumably, Jamie. Because Jamie had said, and I agree with Jamie, I think this would be very, very cool, if you could have it timed like an old school coffee maker where you know, you're know you at work and you want this to come on at, you pre-make it and you want it to come on at noon. And all of a sudden noon hits and your slow cooker turns on. That would be pretty cool. So before we bite into the molten lava and try and see what this tastes like or whatever, it's obviously gonna be hard to show you because it's underneath our beautiful pie crust here. I just wanted to go through sort of an overall thought of this product. The first thing I'll notice, the pot is very unassuming. It, it looks small, but it's actually pretty big. And let me pull that out. Let me, so we gave you the stats on the size. I think it was 34 cups capacity, which is huge. Because it sits inside of this smaller or this bigger cradle, it looks small, but it's really not. And when you have a family uh, of four or six people, you need that size and that volume. 
and this delivers. So that's really, really good. So that's a huge point for me. Uh, overall, everything we did today, I was really impressed. I mean, the potatoes, they were, maybe they were a little bit bigger than what the book, that because the book didn't specify, we would just adjust and say, okay, the potatoes have to go longer. But the sear saute function is really, really cool for veg. If you're gonna build a soup or you're gonna do something like that and saves you having to dirty a pan and you know warm it up on the stove and dump it into your slow cooker. So that's really, really cool. The product is, uh, itself is actually very light which is nice for maybe people who are not as strong as others or who are older than others that have to pull it out from a cupboard. It's not this big cumbersome heavy product. So that's really, really cool that it's uh, light. I don't know what the exact weight is. Maybe Jamie will put it in uh, around me whenever he edits the video. Uh, but it's very, very light. Obviously, as you saw, a lot of different functions, some of which we would never use, like the whole sous vide thing. Uh, I can't see myself doing it in this capacity. For me, it's gonna be pretty much either this bake setting or the slow cooker setting and doing those meals for those nights where, you know, my kids play hockey. Maybe your kids are into other sports or activities or whatever, and it's a school night and, you know, things are chaotic and you want to have something when you come home from work that's been sitting all day on the low setting and it's ready to go and it's, you know, a great meal. Soul cookers are, at least in Canada, uh, more in the winter for like those hardier kind of winter kind of meals. But soul cookers are a, a huge bonus to have, I feel, to be able to do that. The price point itself, now we bought it from the States. Uh, what did I say, it was 149. So we'll call it 200 bucks Canadian. So it's not cheap, but neither is a decent slow cooker. So the next thing, the versatility, again, saving dishes and so on and so forth, the versatility of being able to go pick this right out of the slow cooker and throw it right in the oven like we did in this capacity, that's pretty cool, right? So, I mean, yeah, I guess it's not, you're using the oven and this, so it somehow defeats the purpose of just having a slow cooker, but you're certainly not gonna cook a pie crust top in a slow cooker. So the other thing is, after we did the mac and cheese, there was all this caked on cheese all around it. We thought, oh my God, this is gonna be a disaster to clean it. I have a scrub brush, like a, like a rubber or nylon scrub brush, and just used some hot water. I didn't even use soap initially, and everything came off it immediately. So the non-stick surface is really impressive. Now, will that hold up over time? We'll, we'll soon find out over the next three, six, 12 months, but first time use today, that stuck on cheese, which you all know is the worst thing to have to get off, came off extremely easy. All right, so I'm just gonna try to break into the middle here. So the pie crust is nice and flaky. All right, there, whew, that is that is your danger zone right there. Let's try, give this a try. The pie crust is perfect. It's ugly, but it's perfect. I had a mushroom in there, a piece of green bean, a piece of chicken. It tastes unbelievable, amazing. Like really, really, really good. Other than having to manipulate the pie crust, it's a pretty easy meal to make. That's our video. Hope you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and we'll see you on the next one.